J'accueille avec moi sur scène. And I'm calling Gustavo Gomez Mejia on stage with me. Oh, here you are. So, Gustavo, you are a member of ESTA and you are a professor working with the university in Tours. So first, can you say a few words about the wonderful city of Tours that, in which I live? Well, I just arrived there. It's a great pleasure for me, just as it is for you. So, Gustavo, you come and talk about social adoption of a technology. You are a member of ESTA. We had um, various representatives of ESTA who gave us uh, demos of Rogan sites. And I will let you start your presentation. You're going to talk about the social adoption of a new technology. And as this uh, question mark here uh, show that we are going to try and use your presentation to try and see how this applies to Frogan's technology and Frogan publishers like Esther's. Thank you. Well, this is a very short presentation about this topic on which we work with the Esther group. As you all know, Esther is a multidisciplinary group. We have uh, different backgrounds. And the objective of my presentation is to try and illustrate the complexities linked to the social adoption of a new technology. We could talk about taking ownership, uh, assimilation, adoption. At the end of the day, it's all about something that we talked about many times during the evening. It's about creating uses. And we've seen that if we use this expression, creating uses, it makes things not as easy. There is no magic wand for companies, organizations, web surfers, all become users of a technological innovation. So with this short presentation, I'd like to uh, first explore social adoption as a general topic and then focus on four examples about technological innovations, sometimes in hardware, sometimes in software, sometimes in internet services, and uh, connect this to the use of Frogans because at ASTA we've uh, had a collective thinking process to support the emergence of this technology uh, in a very large audience. So, okay, let's show you slides. Thank you. So we can start with a question that might uh, well, some of you might think that these new technologies are something totally new, but in fact, this topic has already been addressed by for, uh, very old technologies like writing. So, to stick to this framework, we can use this uh, dialogue of Plato my colleague has offered me this wonderful technical device with which I can point at things. So as I know your talents as a comedian, I'd like you to help me. So, Jean-Emmanuel, you will be this Egyptian god who invented scriptures. So these are. this would be the designer of a technological innovation. And now who is going to receive this innovation? That's him. That's King Tammuz, an Egyptian king. So, dear God, would you please present your innovation to me? Oh, king, here is the knowledge that will help the Egyptians to collect more knowledge, more science, and have more memory of knowledge. We found the remedy to memory. Oh, very clever, Tet. 
celui qui peut discerner les chances qu'elles sont d'être un dommage ou un bénéfice. He is lucky the one who can uh, figure out what will be the benefit for those who are going to use this device. So behind that, we see a dichotomy, very traditional one, already uh, pointed out by Plato in Phaedra, where Socrates talks to Phaedra. And what we need to remember is that the, the one who designed scripture, the entrepreneur developing a technology, tends to sell it showing all the benefit. Here is science, here is knowledge, here is memory. Because the designer has a lot of love for his innovation. He's like the father of the innovation. And the god and the king represents the users with this crit critical distance and says, well, I'm sorry, but it's not for you to assess the use of this technology. And this has been in the mind of Hester because we do realize that uh, uh, inventors are not the users. So the comment of this uh, founding uh, dichotomy has already been addressed by philosophers like Derrida. Now, if we think about the social complexity of technological breakthroughs, we can have uh, uh, Steve Jobs in his uh, myth in this mythological paroxystic moment. I'm not going to ask you to pl play the, ro the part of Steve Jobs, but Steve Jobs always said you need to start from customer experience and then work all the way up to technology. You cannot start with technology and then try and decipher to whom you're going to sell it to. This is a mistake I probably made more than any other person in this room, and I have the scars to prove it. So there is this uh, modern mythology of new technologies in which we have a statement to be user-driven, user-friendly, uh, to be on the side of users. But sometimes it's uh, not true. So I'd like to insist on these complexities. Everything is not always focused on users. It's not because you claim it is that it is. And this is something that we want to think about. Frogans is a new way of writing, a new language, a new potential to express ideas, which is very complex. So that's a strategic work that I'd like to explain in four examples fully realizing that each time we are trying to understand what can help the adoption of a new technology. The first crucial factor in what we consider is the adoption of a new technology is uh, the uh, imaginary representations. For us at Esther, it's the first job. We've already uh, talked about issues related to that. It's a very upstream work on representations. We think about the words, the images that come to mind in a very uh, free way. So when you talk about a new technology, what do you think when you think about Frogans? And then what are the arguments that we use when you present Frogans to entrepreneurs, to lawyers, to... So you need to prepare your arguments. And that's very important to help uh, people buy in the new technology. So it's all about making people dream what it can, a technology can is inspire. Uh, we know that the uh, success of, inter of the internet is also uh, due to the success of various images like these information highways uh, which help developing images in the brain of the audience at large. So how can we imagine? How can we dream it? How can we name the objects? Do we call them a site, a frogans, uh, an object? When we talk about the slide, what kind of uh, world 
do we refer to when we talk about surfing? You know, the uh, internet is a very free-flowing world, world in which you can surf. And this helps people uh, buying in these new technologies and adopting these new technologies. More recently, we had the virtual commu communities and then there were the launching of web uh, 3.0 uh, companies. And I'll never forget the day when in 2009, I saw an old lady reading direct morning and the headlines were about Twitter, Twitter, the new way to speak. And you can imagine that the old lady can have access even though she doesn't have a Twitter account. So even we know that the world of technician is not the world of the public at large. So we need to develop an argument to develop um, commercial arguments. And what would be an article about Frogans in the press today, for instance? This is something that we need to think about to find ways for the public at large to adopt the technology. And today we have this potential. We say, well, there is this new world that needs to be created potentially on the networks. There is a small portable device that provides uh, lots of uh, data security with regards to privacy. That's very interesting. So this is the connotation of the word which is going to have to influence the use. And as you said, if there is a piece of article about Frogan in the women's press, it will have been written by a specialist of the Frogan's technology. Yeah, and it will most probably be capable of talking about it to give it this uh, uh, feminine uh, touch. If we talk that sites, we need to make the difference with technical objects that can be named differently. Absolutely. The second opinion we may have about adoption, maybe you're more familiar with it, but that requires for us to wear a different hat. And for us, we can do that because we want to underscore how complex a technology adoption can be. And that's about uh, uh, disseminating a technology. Technologies disseminate in society. They're adopted by various uh, uh, stakeholders in society. So the most important is to find the first adopters of a technology. And you see that there is a different vocabulary depending on your job. We can talk about primary uh, or early adopters, pres prescribers, opinion leaders, if you talk, if you are in communication models, you can have influencers, we can have substitute words, but at the end of the day, they all try and describe a pioneering community that would be just the first link. So it helps identifying a few first links and then make a bet on the magic of society, which is based on limitation. So if someone has done it, OK, I'm going to do it too. It's also based on prestige, emulation. So the entrepreneurial momentum can be based on taking a bet on this emulation, competitive emulation, intellectual emulation, etc., etc. And I think this is a very general en emulation. It can be true for these diagrams. You see the exponential graphs for the adoption of a technology. And then we can start about m mediation mechanisms. You have a first beta version that creates a small circle of privileged uh, users, and then it expands and spreads the good word. So, this is where you have creative uh, uh, players and actors that will create the first link 
for FROGANT. So for these first links, we have a number of users that would be very restricted, but then there is a buzz, and these users set the standard. And you are talking about an increasing number of users. So you were talking about imitation, assimilation. I think you can also talk about jam being jealous. Oh, my competitor has it. Why don't I have one? That's all very clear. Third perspective, and we're getting slightly schizophrenic here, but that's the objective because a social adoption of a technology go through very concrete empirical confrontations. Uh, by empirical, I mean the concrete experience of the piece of software, and, but it's also tactical uh, confrontation because there you have a confrontation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the designers. So designers and users don't always have the same vision. And in this conflict, we can prove that the technology was adopted. And in that respect, there is a progressive discovery by designers of what escapes their strategy. We're close to the sentence mentioned by by Paul or Mr. Paulsmeyer. If we can anticipate all uses, it means that the technology is of no interest. And this is when what you'd not anticipated, uh, the uh, not very orthodox routines in which a frogan site is being used, or ruse, all of us, we have different ways of using a piece of software, or even transgressions, can prove that technology is being adopted if you have small ruses, it means that it belongs to you because you have your own way of managing the technology. It's slightly destabilizing for the designer, but it's a very good proof that the technology has been adopted. And it's in the designer's interest to accept the creativity of its users. And it took time to discover that the Minitel was going to be used for sex services. And maybe it's going to be the same for the happy owner of sex star Frogans. Um, and this could be a surprise, but it will also be a proof that the technology has been adopted. For modern formats, you have the uh, hagatons, which are increasingly popular in an effort to release or set free this flash creativity. And on Frogan's site, how, what would it lead to? I mean, it's all destabilizing, but it uses the possibility of the code, and it helps uh, the designer get the feedback from the field. OK, I make a commitment here. There won't be any porn content on sex star Frogans, because Frogans cannot be uh, registered as a site name to avoid any confusion. OK, last hat you can decide to wear when you start thinking about the social adoption of a technology. And it's about adjustments between users and situations. This is probably the most complex viewpoint, the one that requires the greatest attention to concrete situations. But the starting point is to start thinking to what would motivate people to use such technology instead of such other. And when you start asking yourself this question, and you're not in an easy situation in which you have either desire or need, then you realize that adopting a technology depends on many different factors. First, perception. How is the technology perceived socially? 
What is the environment of the uh, technology? How is it perceived? <laughs> then you have the question of social norms. Is it okay to do that? A few years back, it wasn't very smart having a Facebook page for many companies. Back in 2009, all newspapers, I mean, no one could tell that all newspapers would have their Facebook page. So is it, uh, is there any legitimacy in tweeting during a conference? Now it is, but a few years back it wasn't. So who, how is all this organized socially? And there is the idea that it's not because there is an instruction for use, that there is an official language from designers that users will follow that. And we uh, should turn to those more complex rationales to understand how use emerges. Then there is use niches which reformulates the question of the selection of a technology instead of another. When you have several tools that can perform similar tasks, how can you identify the specialization of each of them? Today, I want to talk to my family in Colombia, and I can use all these apps on my phone. I can use WhatsApp. And I get a vast array of equivalent messaging services. So why would I use my Gmail chat in certain circumstances and WhatsApp is going to be reserved for my family? Why should I do that? Well, in any offering, you have a niche of use, and that leads to the preferences of users. Now, the matter of uh, projects for use. Will new use projects emerge at the contact of this technology? You use a technology because you have a specific need and all of a sudden you identify new potential uses. And the last question is that of familiarity. Think that we are living in a historical momentum and the technology is not always interpreted according to what we already know. A user knows a certain type of language. He will uh, acquire a new knowledge using frogans, and that's um, technical training. And then there are familiarities which are created, likewise, not just for language, but also for gestures. Are we familiar with these? Uh, you know, the, that the Newton by Apple didn't work well because it looked like a tablet back in the days, but it never worked. It's because the body was not used to certain innovations. And for Frogans, the question is there that it's a complex offering, so we need to think about the right channels and think about the uh, situation in which it's going to be used. Is it going to be in mobility? Is it going to give different desktops? How can it be embodied on all the avatars that we have uh, for our screens? Uh, is it going to fight against apps? Are we thinking about this as a collection of apps? I mean, all these questions need to be taken into account and show the richness of the challenge facing the community that gathered here tonight. OK, Gustavo. This um, leads me to a question. If we talk about users and taking ownership, and if we talk about technical communities, for instance, you were talking about the Newton product by Apple. The Frogans technology is an open standard. Is this freedom of use, is it a beneficial factor to support uh, adoption. Yes, it is an asset because some communities are very sensitive to this. So there is legibility 
for a community that shares the same interest. Then the question is, how can we structure these communities and how can we uh, welcome their innovation? Yes, it could have been a discriminating factor, but in fact, it opens new doors. Gracias. Thank you very much indeed, Gustavo. Uh, I'd like to ask you a totally subjective question. Uh, you talked about references, we talked about Plato, and we talked about more modern uh, authors. The social adoption of technologies was an approach which was analyzed later. Now, we see something uh, coming out. So for you as a scientist, is it always interesting to see something new coming on the market? Yes, and it's a motivation because I think it's a great opportunity to be there when the uh, technology is being formalized and see it evolving and developing and growing because we are dealing with new objects with new possibilities for the future. And as a scientist, I have this fascination because we can explore the language, but in real time, we can see new adoptions. And this is uh, fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. So we'll take a few questions from the audience about the social adoption of new technologies. We can talk about Nestor's, Esther's uh, work. You work with the Esther group. You are on the scientific side, like Etienne was also a representative of the scientific community, but you're also technicians, experts in marketing, and very much expert on online presence. So I encourage everyone here to visit your website. Do we have any questions? Yes, one very short question. In the various examples of technologies that were launched, some successful, some not, are there any technologies that you would think about that would be close to the Frogans technology as we know it? Well, we need to talk about adjusting context to situations. I don't have a list. It's just a series of feelings. I've seen technologies emerging, and to me, your question is driven by a vision as if we could name technologies as such, but with Frogans. What's interesting is that for a technician, from a technician perspective, the technology does exist. So if I had the expertise, I would talk about Hypercard or other names in technology or flash or blah, blah, blah. I mean, I could imagine a certain number of uh, names, but in the social world, technical objects do, do not exist as technical objects. So they would remind us of technologies like flyers or other small forms. I can't answer your question because I don't have a list of inventions, but the question is, like such object can exist technically as an MP3 file, but can also exist as a song. So it's a no answer. I'm sorry. Well, I'll be. Ple I'm very pleased with your answer. Thank you.